Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Braden Chamberlain, Vice President of RMA. Um, for those of you that have not signed in, we do have a sign up sheet over by Skip that put down your email and name if you'd like to get our newsletter. Um, I'm going to have Mike talk about using Facebook versus email. Um, and so, yeah. so, so, what we want to do. <laughs> I do a lot of stuff, and now I just don't have as much time to, to maintain stuff. You may have noticed by the lack of newsletters lately. Um, we've been posting the videos from each of the meetings, but we haven't had like a bunch of content of people fishing and what's going on. And so what I want to try to do is instead of submitting any fishing reports by email, if you can submit them to our Facebook page, then all I have to do is, is just approve your post. So you can actually, we, we allow you to post to our Facebook page, but it won't post immediately. Um, what will happen is it will come to me and I'll be able to review it, make sure it's not some bot or something like that trying to sell, sell weird stuff, and then I can post it. And then if we can do it that way, then our Facebook can start becoming more dynamic with users and stuff and more useful to you guys. I like that. Um, so yeah, if, if, wh what do you guys think about that? I don't know. Yeah. I think it's a little bit easier too. I think if people are out, actually out fishing instead of having to sit down and write an email, you can just send me a picture and say, this is what we caught today. Like literally, you don't have to type anything, just send me a picture. My people just want pictures anyway. Yeah, my own concern is for people that don't have Facebook, but. And we can still send out, so what I'm thinking is I might send a summary of our Facebook post in an email, because you're right, we do have a lot of older members yes. and some of them just aren't on social media too, so that's actually a good idea. So, but it gives me an opportunity to get stuff out there quicker, because right now, as far as newsletters go, I'm about two and a half months behind. Um, we have, we're all caught up with our YouTube channel and stuff if you want to go see the spe what the speaker said, but um, that way I can just, we can be a little bit more dynamic. So look up our Facebook page. It's, uh, I usually put the link to our Facebook page in our email and uh, our YouTube, and we're going to try to use Facebook a little bit more than, than email. So if you have any questions, you can come ask me. Do you, do you, on the Facebook page, do you, do you put in events that way? Yes. Okay. So this event's on there regularly. Um, and then, were you talking? Did you talk about this stuff? Uh, I haven't. Yeah, we were. Uh, we were going to make sure that everyone got a ticket for the raffle. I think. Oh, I didn't get I think so. Oh, you didn't get one. I didn't get one. <laughs> I'm also part one. <laughs> Social and as you can Great tell, oh yeah, no problem. And, and as you can tell, most of our uh, presidency is, isn't here, and uh, so they're on a fishing expedition. So it's going to be a little less formal today. But are, is there any other club business that needs to be brought to the group before we get started? Okay. All right. Well, um, Chris, thank you so much for coming. Chris is over the central region, and he's going to be talking to us about the. Deer Creek Reservoir Trail Survey. And so I will turn the time over to Chris and we'll go to about 7.45 and then typically Shills comes in and talks about different equipment. So. Appreciate it. Get this microphone set up so you guys can hear me a little bit better. My name is Chris Crockett. I'm the regional aquatics manager in our central region. So I'm outside of, uh, excuse me, I, I work out of the Springville office, but if you're a big game hunter, you're probably pretty familiar with our boundaries, but basically I cover Deer Creek, Jordanelle, Strawberry, Utah Lake, um, all the way down to Yuba. So our boundaries aren't always based on watersheds, uh, but most of the time they are. So Provo River, places like that. So. Um, I should point out um, that I work with a lot of other guys. Um, we each kind of have our, our area of expertise. Um, Mike Slater is our sport fish coordinator. 
We also have a new biologist that's recently come on. His name is Tyler Robinson. He just got married and on the, the way back ended up getting sick, so I'll have to give him a hard time about making it. I was going to kind of throw him to the wolves tonight and let him talk to you guys. But we're pretty excited to have Tyler on board. He has a He's from Minnesota, but he has a, a background in walleye, um, does a lot of largemouth bass fishing, so I think, I think he's going to be a pretty good addition to some of us who are more focused on some of the cold water species. So it's been a while since I've been here, so I guess where I'm saying is uh, we'd love to come back, kind of make this a routine thing, and if there's any water within our region that you're specifically interested in, you know, kind of let me know at the end of the day. or. Uh, let's give or, or badger no and we'll kind of try to make a habit of coming to visit basically so uh, badger where do i need to stand i just kind of picked my spot you're good i'll move you do it <laughs> okay sounds good so uh the title tonight I, I noticed on the the agenda was proposed changes i think I think that was clickbait that Skip sent out there so you guys would all show up and yell at me and think we're going <laughs> to propose something too crazy at Deer Creek. Um, but really what I'm going to talk to you about is some of the information that we've collected from anglers during our creel. Part of that you'll see was asking for feedback from those anglers. Uh, so we're really still in this, you know, taking comment period. I don't have any grand complete changes proposed for Deer Creek. I will throw that out right now. Uh, but I did want to present some of the data we've got. Hear what you have to say as well in terms of any suggestions, ideas you have, or things that maybe you want us to kind of look at for, you know, in moving into the future. You guys know the division. We, we can be accused of moving a little bit too slow, but a lot of times what we're trying to do there is make sure we've got the information we need, make sure we're not kind of going out on a whim on our end or just listening to a very small section of anglers. So we're trying to talk to everybody, make sure we know what people want. So I um, apologize that's a, a little bit small for you guys to read, but I'll kind of hit the high points. So I think everybody's probably familiar with Deer Creek or Reservoir. Um, it was built or, or finished in about 1941. Part of Central Utah project uh, with all the other storage facilities along the, the Provo River and within that drainage such as Jordan Nail. Um, it is uh, managed as what we call a two-tier fishery uh, or a two-story fishery. Basically what we're, all we're saying there is we have water conditions and habitat that allow us to manage for cold water fishery, in this case being rainbow trout, uh, but also it's a uh, reservoir that can be good habitat for either cool water or warm water species like walleye, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, etc. So most of you know we've got quite a few other species uh, that have shown up in Deer Creek uh, either from upstream drainages or we've had a couple of illegal introductions. Uh, but really most of the fishing centers around walleye, yellow perch, black bass, um, rainbow trout, some brown trout thrown in there. So. That'll mostly be the species that I focus on tonight. So if I, if I skip over your favorite species, apologies, um, but we'd be happy to take questions on it. So it is designated a blue ribbon fishery. So if you're not familiar with what that means, we have a blue ribbon fisheries advisory council uh, that has numerous members. We've had reps from Rocky Mountain Anglers. I don't know that we have a Rocky Mountain Angler rep on there right now. We basically kind of cycle through there if you guys are interested in a rep on there. There is a process for nominating an individual and be happy to kind of talk about that offline. But basically the Blue Ribbon Group is a bunch of angler representatives from Trout Unlimited, the past Rocky Mountain Anglers, etc. And they actually score these waters. So I mean there is a little bit of, uh, of uh, subjectivity to it, um, but they're looking through a very precise list of What's the catch rates? How satisfied are anglers? What is, uh, excuse me, what are the access opportunities, et cetera? So it's not just us. If it was, you know, up to me, I'd have every water designated blue ribbon fishery, but it is a competitive process. Deer Creek's been a blue ribbon fishery for, I, I, I can't even, before my time. So it's it's been consistently a blue ribbon water, one of our better ones. I'm going to talk about creel surveys and. Probably everyone knows what a creel survey is, but if not, 
Krill survey is really just our opportunity to collect data from anglers. So I mean, other times we've come and we've presented our, our net data, and that's, that's great, that's awesome, but also we want to hear from anglers what they're catching, what they're fishing for, how satisfied they are with the fishery. So that's, that's really what I'm gonna to present tonight, and you know, obviously it kind of just gets its name from you know, the traditional basket creel uh, or a harvest creel, and that's where you get the creel survey name from. And we do uh, measure uh, and take some uh, information from those fish that anglers do actually catch, as well as asking some of those uh, opinion questions. So I'll skip through this fairly quickly because it's, it's not necessarily too exciting, but I just maybe wanted to throw out a couple of little things here. We actually started this survey in January of 2020. And I have a hard time remembering 2020 because it's a blur for a lot of people. Um, about that time, we had uh, COVID, um, we had uh, state parks shutting down uh, until everyone kind of got a handle on what was happening with COVID, what was our risk of transmission, et cetera. So we started it and then basically had to pump the brakes on it um, until a little bit later in 2020 when the state park reopened. So you might see you might see two little data points on occasion. One that says 2020, that's that, that short three month bit of creel. But then we went back and did a full year creel. But that went from July of 2020 to the end of June 2021. So it's still a 12 month calendar creel, but if you wonder why the date is presented July to July, that's essentially what you're looking at. Um, I've already kind of hit some of these, uh, but I will just say um, when we are Talking with anglers, um, we are trying to get a representation of the effort. So uh, we're trying to make sure that we're out there enough that the data is statistically valid. We're hitting it in um, the morning and the evening. We're hitting it on the weekends and the weekdays. There is one fallacy on some of these creels is that we miss night fishing. So this creel ends 30 minutes after sundown. Some of our other reservoirs where we know we have a lot of night fishing, we do um, try to capture that, but I'll be quite honest with you, our creel survey dollars are usually pretty limited. So that is definitely an area where you could say, hey, you guys missed all the night fishing for walleye or something like that. And that's, that's totally valid. Um, for our survey purposes, um, we did divide the reservoir up into uh, about uh, five geographic areas and really the reason we're doing this is not necessarily that we're expecting a lot of different use, but when we go and do angler counts, we, we can't pull out our binox and count absolutely everybody on the reservoir at one time. So we break the reservoir into sections when we're doing it. And this is most important again just for help us get an accurate count of anglers. So you'll see eventually I'll talk about total angler hours. That is information where we go out to each one of these areas. Sometimes we're in a boat, sometimes we're on shore watching you with the binocs. So yes, you are being watched, but it's not nefarious. Um, trying to get an accurate head count and boat count of everybody that's fishing. Um, we've already hit on a little bit of this, but when we're talking with anglers, we've got those angler counts, right? So that helps give us the angler hours. But also we're doing interviews with anglers. We ask them, guys, if you've ever been one of these, you know, you're probably like, oh gosh, can I go fishing now, you know? But this is very important data because we're asking the anglers, what are you fishing for? Where are you from? How long have you been fishing? What are you catching, et cetera? And typically we're also asking some opinion questions. So a couple of the most common that were included on this is we're, we're asking you, how satisfied are you with the fishing opportunities? And you can say, you know, it's terrible, um, or you can say it's great. And so basically you, you've got your choices of very satisfied all the way down to very dissatisfied. A typical follow-up on that as well is what can we do to improve in other words, if you're, if you're happy, is there anything else we can do? If you're not happy, then definitely tell us what we can do to improve your fishing experience on the reservoir. So um, you guys, let me get caught up. Some of these I might have to actually glance at my, my numbers. But really, one of the most important things that came from this Creel survey 
was looking at what we call you know angler use angler pressure angler hours is how we track it basically so in other words how many anglers are out there and how much time they're spending so one angler hour means the angler was fishing for one hour if you're an angler and you fish for 10 hours that's 10 angler hours so this is a pretty common metric across the u.s that's used to uh, basically evaluate pressure how many anglers hours do we have out there um, so in 2020, 2021, um, this is that standardized 12-month data, we had about 236,000 angler hours. I will point out, well, let's, I'll get to it in just a minute actually, um, I will point out, you know, this is a pretty traditional angler use. So we've got, um, we've got calendar month and we have angler hours. So not unusual for us to see this in most reservoirs in Utah you know most of your use is concentrated you know as soon as the ice comes off everybody's eager to get out there they get out they're fishing you know March April May June um, and then it gradually starts to die off a little bit in the fall there can still be some great fishing especially on Deer Creek in the fall but this is a pretty traditional trend that we see you know the hunts come on people go back to school etc um, I will just point out Obviously, these two months here, December, three months, December, January, February, are heavily impacted by ice conditions. If you remember the winter of 2020, that was kind of an odd one. We had actually some ice fishing available, uh, but throughout that month, we also had some open water fishing available. So it was, it was kind of, a, of an interesting one. Um, on an area like uh, Strawberry that consistently gets great ice, you won't see that dip down as much. Uh, looking at geographic pressure, so nothing really here to see. Uh, again, this was mostly for us to get good counts. Uh, the reservoir on an annual basis seems pretty equal to use. You guys know if you looked at this, you know, for a specific species, specific time of year, you might see something a little different. Looking at a little closer at that 236,000 angler hours here total, uh, this is something we see at most reservoirs. You typically, if you have good conditions, both for shore and for boating, you typically have you know a majority of, uh, or excuse me, slightly over 50% that's coming from boat anglers. Deer Creek's got pretty good shore access, so we still had about 46% of those hours coming from shore anglers not necessarily surprising if you're out in a boat hopefully you've got a little bit of an advantage when it comes to fishing um, and subsequently we see our catch rate at about three quarters of a fish per hour that's how these catch anytime you see rate you can think per hour um, opportunity or excuse me catch rates a little bit lower at the shore but still the, these are weighted actually for um, the hours but you still see that our catch rate on Deer Creek, all species combined, uh, is about half a fish per hour. Our statewide goal, it used to be half a fish per hour. Now, given some of our limitations, we're still usually pretty happy with about 0.4 fish per hour. But anytime we see it over half a fish per hour, myself as a manager is pretty happy with that. Now, that doesn't mean we don't want more fish, better catch rates, etc. Um, but I'm just kind of laying that out there. One of our metrics is looking at if you've got half a fish per hour, hopefully you're feeling pretty good. Now I know Badger can catch like 12 fish per hour, and then I'm over there like catching nothing in 12 hours. So you have to consider this is averaged out. So if you guys are like, that's ridiculous, I catch 10 times that, you may very well. But then you've got people like me that can barely keep my four-year-old you know, out of the water and hasn't caught anything all day. And obviously those kind of average each other out. When we look at the species that people are targeting, so this is when we're actually asking everybody, it's like, hey, what are you targeting? Um, not surprising, so let me, let me rephrase this. You guys can probably see this here. We have our old creel data, 2005. We have that little blip of the three-month creel pre-COVID, and then we have our 12-month creel. I kind of kept this little blip in there just, just as a gee whiz, but I would really, the most consistent data is to compare 
that 2021 and the and the dark orange or red there to that 2005 in the yellow. When we ask anglers what they are targeting from 2021 and 2005, fairly consistent answers. So most of our anglers are targeting rainbow trout or trout. So when we ask anglers what they're fishing for, some guys answer trout. And we go, rainbow or brown? And they go, just trout. So that's kind of where you see that little bit of a little bit of an oddity in the data. But in reality, most of our anglers are after trout, and that's been consistent from 2021 as well as our 2005 data. Our second most targeted species in 2021 uh, was black bass. That is up a little bit. Um, if you look at some of the data relative to um, both the black bass uh, uh, lumped, which is essentially bass. Most anglers are obviously after smallmouth bass, but we have seen an uptick a little bit in the number of people that are pursuing largemouth bass. That seems about right to me. I don't know if that seems about right to you. I've been with the division for 15 years, been involved in some flavor of management on Deer Creek for the last 10. That seems about right to me. We've seen an increase in individuals that are targeting uh, black bass, specifically smallmouth. And that jives with some of our other reservoirs that we've seen that have both of those species. I should say, you guys feel free to wave your hand if you got any questions. Yep. Just curious, I know they have a couple of answers now, but not your creek. Are you able to answer why they have a point in your creek? Yes. A um, couple of reasons. We've been a little bit uncertain about interactions with the brown trout fishery in the middle Provo and Kokanee. So I say uncertain because right now if you like, you know, made me say if they would have an impact or not, I don't know that I have a great answer yet now. Kokanee can, obviously they come up into spawn, overlap a little bit, right? So your cokes are, you know, a little bit earlier, but your cokes are coming up into spawn um, September, mid-September-ish. The brown trout spawn can start a little bit, well, it typically does start a little bit later, but we are worried about that period of overlap having a negative impact on brown trout. You guys probably know how valuable both the lower and middle Provo River are for brown trout fishery. We get like 30,000 angler hours per, um, or per mile. I mean, it's ridiculous the pressure we get. The other thing that's left us a little bit cautious is you guys know coconut or major zooplankton course, right? Most of the rainbows in Deer Creek also have a very, very high percentage of their diet that comes from zoops. So we're worried about a negative interaction there because one of the great things I think, you guys can tell me I'm wrong, about Deer Creek, it is one of the few places locally that we're able to pretty quickly grow fat rainbows. And so this is definitely something that we have considered. It is probably something we will still be taking feedback on in the future, but that's why we're not just immediately rushing into it. The other aspect of that one is we, we try not to have the exact same species right next to each other. So we've got Deer Creek and Jordanelle. As a manager, I would tend to kind of want to manage towards the strengths of each of those, but not necessarily have the exact same species composition. Was there another question? Yeah, was that the reason why you were wanting to get like the black crappie and, and all that stuff out of there as well? The same concern with the zoop like that? Yeah, so the, the crappie is a little bit different. Um, they will eat a lot of zoops, but they're also highly piscivorous. So anytime we see something like white bass, crappie um, show up in a reservoir where we had not planned on them, we're always worried about competition, but also predation. Uh, because, you know, a small black crappie can still pick off a lot of juvenile, uh, smallmouth bass, juvenile rainbows, you name it. So. Any other questions on that? So just taking a little bit deeper dive into this, I won't, I won't go through all of these numbers because um, typically you see the, you know, the 
the pressure rates are going to be about the same as the harvest rates, etc. Um, but just looking at the rainbow trout, um, they represented 62% of the catch, and smallmouth bass eat, represented about 25% of the catch. Not surprisingly, when you look at uh, numbers harvested, um, there was a higher percentage of individuals, excuse me, a higher percentage of rainbow trout harvested than smallmouth bass. Makes sense. I mean, there's a lot of us that release plenty of rainbow trout, uh, but especially when you look at black bass fishing, it's often predominantly catch and release. And that's just angler preference, not saying that's good or that's bad. Looking at, again, just same data, but just looking at it a little bit different, uh, looking at percent of catch and harvest by each species. Again, you see that 63% catch of the rainbows uh, with the harvest going about 45%. And you've got the smallmouth bass with this huge representation of catch, but very small relative harvest. That's the, the light color there. Looking at uh, catch per year, and this is all combined, it looks very similar to pressure, right? So I mean, basically you've kind of got that same trend. You're catching most of your fish in uh, spring and summer. Um, you've got a drop down in the winter. And again, that's, that's pretty highly dependent on whether or not you've got really good ice or not. I'll talk more about these species, but I just wanted to throw up this graph in case we don't maybe get to, to all of these guys that you're interested in. This is total length on the x-axis. Uh, this is harvested species on uh, the y-axis. And just to kind of maybe state the obvious, we are only measuring what anglers have in their creel. So that means they're harvesting it. I mean, they might throw one back. Um, but when we roll up on a boat, we're only harvesting what they have in their live well, basically. So that's why we only have this information on harvested fish. Um, not surprising, um, we've got a fairly small number of browns, uh, but pretty large relative size, about 18 inches on average. Our walleye and our rainbow trout, you can see our huge variation here. Uh, but looking at our kind of our cheat sheet on our English metrics, <clears throat> Uh, they're about 15 inches on average size, but for both the walleye and the rainbow trout, they get harvested. And again, we'll look at some of these a little bit more detail. On your field netting for the walleye, where are you finding more of the walleye? Is it more about the island or the Charleston side? That is secret proprietary data that I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember. I would have to. I would hesitate to say until I pulled up the data. It's been. A couple of years since we have done our gill net data, I'd be happy to bring that back to you guys at any time or just pull out the report and share it with you. We will probably survey gill nets again either in next year or the year after. We, we do it on about a three to a four year cycle. At a reservoir that's undergoing changes, like when we did all the changes at Jordan L, we were doing the monitoring every year for like five years. But at Deer Creek, where it's, it's, it's been kind of running its, its same game, we haven't made too many uh, management changes throughout the years, we're pretty conservative and we only do that every three to five years. I, I have a quick, <clears throat> possibly unrelated question. Do, do carp serve any purpose in the state of Utah as far as a useful fish? <laughs> I'm, I'm being kind of funny about it, but at the same time, I'm a little serious. If you ask, you, you will probably get several different answers to that question. Within the DWR? It, it depends. So I'll tell you my take on it. Um, at a reservoir like Deer Creek, somebody will come shoot me to say this, they're probably not doing any harm. I don't think, let me rephrase that, they're not doing any harm in the densities that we find them. That being said, I don't really think they're providing much for forage opportunities either. So um, I don't know that they're doing any that much harm in the densities there, but they're, doing, they're not doing any good. If you look at a reservoir like Utah Lake, where you have carp biomass uh, tying up 95% of the total fish biomass, and they're going around in those shallow areas and pulling up all the aquatic vegetation that could have been habitat for June suckers or largemouth bass or all of the above, they are definitely detrimental. So 
as a rule, I'm not a huge, you know, if, if we did not have CARP in the state of Utah, I think it's safe to say we would be doing much better. Um, but as to their impacts, it, it often depends on what type of system they're in. They have a hard time in colder, colder waters, is that true? Yes, yeah, so they, they are a very fecund fish and can pull off the spawn just about anywhere. But in reservoirs like Deer Creek and Jordan Elm, where they're mostly too cold, um, they're not gonna get as much survivorship on their eggs. So that's why you see them in fairly low numbers. Also, like a place like Deer Creek, Jordan Elm, you've got a lot of mouths to feed. So even though those carp can grow tall very quickly, and exceed the gate width of, of some fish. Uh, when you've got all of those smallmouth bass in the shallows as well, um, they're gonna pick off some of those small carp pretty fast. So yeah, you're, you're never gonna offend me if you take a carp home and you know put it under your tomato plants. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I only throw out just the, you know, the difference in that some places they're not great, but they're not the end of the world. Whereas other places like Utah Lake, they're they're definitely not great. So, and we can talk about their role at Yuba because that's something we've been kind of trying to figure out when we've got such um, drastic conditions at Yuba, where uh, some of those other species can't do very well. We have seen carp play a pretty important role in the stomachs, you know, in, in the food web of um, walleye, northern pike, etc. Down there, but that's a pretty extreme situation where we've already got lots of other variables that are creating a lot of issues now that you Cuba. Thanks. Um, so I'll hit some of the high points on these uh, species that are kind of of most interest. And if I, if I leave off any of these, again, I'd be happy to, to share any of the, the creel data information um, with everyone else. So a rainbow trout, um, this was a species we've already talked about. It's the most sought after. It's the highest catch rates, uh, around 0.33 fish per hour. 43% of those were harvested. We talked about that already a little bit. Um, on our couple of our graphs here, we have again uh, x-axis being the month starting with July to June and looking at fish per hour. Just give you an, an idea of catch rate. So for those of you that fish it, this is probably not surprising. Um, I don't fish Deer Creek that much, but man, when November rolls around, I'm out there fishing for rainbow. Um, you guys are probably catching them all the time, but uh, when I'm trying to get out, most of the time our highest catch rates are in November and December. Um, I was a little surprised at this March catch rate. I was trying to determine if there was a biological reason for that or if it was really just ice off and everybody's out there. I would have thought April would have been higher to respond. Yeah, that's... I thought they'd get three of them in a couple hours. That's exactly what threw me off is when I was looking, trying to figure out the biology of it, I was really surprised that March was higher than April. So, and, you know, if we've had a good ice year, there is a little bit of a, a feeding frenzy. You know, we always talk about it, kind of this I saw feeding frenzy. We talk about it a lot at Strawberry. All of a sudden, um, we've got these hungry fish. Um, they've been kind of, you know, subsisting on zooplankton and power bait leftovers under the ice and as soon as all that ice comes off you have um, you know all this other opportunity to offer them something uh, but you also when that ice comes off usually get a pulse of food and, and detritus coming in with uh, with runoff from the reservoirs or excuse me runoff from the streams so but yeah that one that one kind of surprised me so when you look at the leak frequency histogram so this is uh, we've got length here and frequency here. So kind of the way to read this, I've got my cheat sheet up there for inches. So you've got a lot of fish basically in this 15 inch range. So if you kind of follow this over roughly, you know, you've got like 50% or so of those uh, falling into this range. Another way to read this is, you know, you've not surprisingly, you've got a few uh, of your smaller fish. These could be some of the ones that we just stocked um, we do have natural reproduction in Deer Creek. I don't know that it's a huge player in that, but in other words, you read this and you're like, hey, we've got all these juvenile fish. We've got these multiple year classes, probably two and three year olds stacked up in this you know, 15 to 18 inch range. And then you have a smaller proportion, understandably, of some of those very big rainbow trout. 
So I, I think I hit on this, but our average rainbow trout that's getting harvested is about at this 15 inch level. And when we look at our actual data from our nets, that's about right. Anglers are doing a pretty good job of kind of catching what's actually available there for rainbow trout. Brown trout, I, I lumped this in because again, we kind of talk about sometimes about people just fishing for trout. We do have fairly low catch rates, um, not surprising, fairly low densities of brown trout in Deer Creek, um, but we do have a fairly large average size. I mean, I, I've caught 20 inch browns out of Deer Creek. I know people pull bigger ones than that all the time. It's kind of a nice opportunity, you know, um, you're fishing usually for smallmouth, sometimes for rainbows, and you get one of these nice big brown trout. What's the behavior differences between the rainbow and the browns? I always, I fish Deer Creek a lot, I never get a brown. So most of my experience is the browns are typically going to be hanging around um, any sort of the tributaries that come in. That being said, I don't know that I have a great reason for it, but I've seen some big browns come out of fairly deep water as well. I think some of these browns, once they hit a certain size, maybe that 20 inch route, maybe even smaller, um, they're switching over to a different um, feeding regime. So they're not picking up bugs and little zooplankton and everything. They're eating small, small mouth. They're eating, they're sitting there at the hatchery truck waiting for those undersized rainbow trout to come in. Um, and so I, that's, that's kind of been my experience. I don't have enough data actually on the population at Deer Creek to know really their habitat preferences, to be honest with you. Most of my experience on those guys is from catching them. Because even when we set our nets, we don't get very many unless we're actually setting right at the, where the river comes in for the most part. Um, I will just kind of, with that thought in mind, I will just kind of throw out here the fairly small numbers again of, har of harvested, but still there's three distinct year classes. So it's not only the big browns that are hanging out, but it's definitely more uh, of those larger ones. There could be some in lake reproduction, but more than likely we're just seeing these fish come in from the Provo River. I can add to that, uh, when I've caught 20 inch brown trout, I've been fit, uh, trolling for rainbows, but I'll put a Rapala down deeper. Yep. And that's where I've caught the larger brown trout. Okay. Uh, if, I'm try, if I'm going uh, 20 feet for rainbows, sometimes I put a Rapala down 30 or 40 feet on a downrigger. Okay. I think that's a solid observation, kind of like what we were talking about, them switching over and probably feeding off those smaller rainbows. I know some guys that they're always calling and asking when we're going to stock fish because um, stock rainbows, not because they necessarily want to go fish for rainbows, but because they want to know when to break out their, you know, their 10 inch swim baits or rainbow swim baits to fish for big browns or big smallmouth bass. Do the walleye hit harder those or no? Pardon? Do the walleye hit harder those smaller fish? Yes. Yeah, um, I don't have good stomach content analysis on the walleye, but um, typically, if so, rainbow trout. There's not much of a gape limitation on that. So I mean, you could have a walleye easily if it was wanting to eat a rainbow trout half its size. So, so if you've got your 20-inch walleye, then your you know, yeah, your small rainbows um, are definitely within that zone. And you've got those naturally reproduced rainbows. And we occasionally have extra fish um, that go in undersized. We, we typically are always trying to hit that 10 inch rainbow mark to cut down on predation. Um, but if you look at some of our stocking surveys, you'll see where we've got extra fish or if we're over capacity or something like that. And so occasionally there'll be that batch of three to four inch rainbows go in. And relatively speaking, you still get pretty good survivorship, but there's no doubt there's some predation happening. Smallmouth bass, uh, similar graphs here. You've got your uh, months here, starting with July, and your fish per hour, so this is your catch rates, as well as you've got your link frequency and your total length here. So just a couple of things. Um, only 5% of the anglers that we talked to um, were, were harvesting, or excuse me, were targeting bass, but they were still about 25% of the catch. So in other words, basically you've got a lot of people that are fishing for something else, or they're fishing for any fish that are still catching a pretty pretty high percentage of smallmouth bass. 
But again, not surprisingly, only about 3% of those were harvested. Uh, most of the time, your anglers that are targeting these fish will release them. I also have noticed that there's a lot of people that don't know that you know black bass can be pretty good eating. I grew up in Tennessee, so it was not uncommon for us to eat black bass back there. I'm not suggesting people go harvest more, but I'm just a little bit surprised that there's not more harvest that happens. Looking at uh, average links here, again, I'm really just kind of pointing out that we have multiple year classes. So as a biologist, I'm always looking to make sure that reproduction is happening in this small end. I'm always looking to make sure we've got some big ones. If I see everything really stacked up there, then it makes me think it might be a stunted population. Like if you looked at one for Jordan L, where everything's um, kind of stacked up at that eight to 10 inch range, that would be a different graph. You have like everything really concentrated here. So bottom line is I'm pretty happy with what we're seeing there at Deer Creek. What's the average size of the uh, Average size of these, I don't have my cheat sheet, uh, but it's gonna be about, what is that, about 10 inches, something like that. So. Walleye, so this was something that did surprise me. So I always think of walleye, I always, when I think of Deer Creek, I think of it's a great walleye fishery. And it is at the right time of year, but I was surprised when we did this survey that we only found that less than 1% of the people out there year round were targeting walleye. Now you and I know that if you looked at it month by month, you definitely see some areas where people were spending the most time. Um, and when you look at monthly catch rates, this one stopped me a little bit too, because we have really high catch rates in July, pretty high in June, but were the walleye just not cooperating <laughs> for a couple of months in, in May and March? This one, this one kind of surprised me. When I was looking at the old 2005 creel data, it was pretty similar. So either in 2005, there was only about 1% of the anglers that were targeting walleye, and I really thought just from my experience that we had seen that go up quite a bit over the past few years. Um, so I just got kind of thrown out, these are one of the things that surprised me is that it's been pretty consistent, really. It's because May Willard's hot. <laughs> is that, is that what, yeah, it's like the, the two guys fishing for walleye just you know go on vacation in May. Um, again, looking at the leak frequencies, pretty happy here. Our average size uh, that anglers are harvesting is 15 inches. Not a trophy, but not a bad fillet either. And we're seeing multiple year classes. So again, I'm kind of pointing this out. Nice year classes of reproduction. You've kind of got these, you know, two, three, four year olds here that are still uh, in pretty high percentage. And then of course we've got some some big ones out there as well. Is this part of it because you guys don't do it in the high fishing? That's what I was wondering. That's kind of why I brought up that, you know, that laid out that criticism but when I, I said, to play Deer Creek for a at night, and that's why I don't do it personally, but I'd like to, but yeah. I, I, how, how I think that's when, definitely a reason. How do you know when you guys are interpreting data that it's not all skewed by the dominant biomass being trout and the easiest to catch? Because if there's a lot, as a lake filled with crappie and walleye, and that was the predominant of the biomass, obviously more people would target those species. Yep. So how do you how do you balance that you're they're not fishing for what you're putting in there versus what they'd actually prefer? Right. So that's a complicated question. I will throw out the only thing that on these surveys, the only thing we can ask the anglers at the lake is what they are targeting. Um, so you are absolutely right. If you've got, you know, build it and they will come type of idea, right? If it's predominantly the rainbows are doing great, um, and you ask all the anglers what they like and what they're fishing for, you're probably talking to people that came out there to target rainbows, right? The real question and the kind of the other side of it is what would everybody else like? And that's something that we try to ask um, on a statewide survey that we do. I don't know if you guys have ever gotten one or not, but we typically send out uh, an email. We take a subsample of all our license holders that have provided us the email address and we'll ask a question like that, like what fishery, you know, what underutilized species would you like to see more of? Um, if you have a better idea for that, I, I would love, I'm, I'm serious, I'd, I'd like to hear it, because we ask ourselves that too. It's like, we're talking to the guys that are fishing Deer Creek. 
it's a predominantly rainbow fishery, so we're always going to kind of get this positive feedback, if you will, of people that want to catch more rainbows. But the difficult thing is figuring out in this geographic area, all those anglers that we've got, you know, all those license holders, what would they like to see? And it's a very difficult question to ask because it's like, if they're not fishing it, how do you ask somebody what they want? And the other thing is, if they're not familiar with it, are you going to get a good answer? Like, if you ask me something about some fishery I've never fished before, I may pick, you know, barracuda, when in reality that's not a very educated answer. So, but I totally acknowledge the, you know, the, the bias that you might have asking a question about rainbows at a rainbow fishery, you're always going to kind of get those rainbow anglers that may give you a different story than somebody else who wants to see another species. I had a question. Yep. Um, as far as these, what what time of day are the surveys taken for, for these? Because I know a lot of the guys who do target walleye are going to go super early in the morning, and they're usually off the lake by 10 or 11 o'clock because of the wake boats. So, right. so. It's a great question. So that kind of feeds into this one. Are we missing walleye anglers? So these are uh, 30 minutes before sunrise to 30 minutes after sunset. So if you're not in that time period, then yes, your angler hours are not captured and you're, you, we could definitely be missing people relative to walleye. Good, very good questions. And then again, kind of acknowledging the weakness of, of some of this survey data. So I have a question for you. Yeah. Do you think your numbers are skewed by the rec boaters that, you know, dad wants to take his kids out to catch fish early and then go back and you know, gather up the crew and then go, you know, wakeboard and whatever the rest of the day? And they just want to catch a fish, so trap's the easiest? I think the answer is, is yes, but I wouldn't say skewed. I would say averaged out. Okay. So we, when we collect this data, one of those questions that I kind of skipped over is we ask people, um, how many times a year do they fish Deer Creek? Now that's not necessarily weeding out your average casual fisherman that comes pretty often but um, we do have that ability to say okay let's let's rerun these numbers relative to the guys that are out there 10 or more times you might be able to weed out those you know average anglers and it could be some very valuable data from our standpoint though as a you know as a manager we are managing Deer Creek right now for kind of the average angler. Um, but the, in some of our other waters, we have done that where we try to break that down. If you ask somebody to rate their level of fishing expertise, I can, you can probably imagine that everybody is an expert. We've, we've tried, <laughs> myself included, we've tried to do that and we've kind of found that that just, it, it's not very valuable data uh, because everybody always, you know, ranks themselves a couple of areas higher. Um, in a perfect world, if we could get an honest answer, then maybe it'd be different. But that's why we go with asking people how many times they go out. So at least even if you're not catching an expert, you're catching somebody that has some experience uh, and you're catching somebody that at least spends enough time on the reservoir that you might get a great answer. And I'm not saying we don't want the answer of somebody that's never been there before, um, but it, it does kind of help give us a little bit of insight. Yep. Yellow perch, this will be the last one I kind of go into detail on. Um, again, this one was very similar in terms of uh, effort. We had about 5% of the people who were interested in yellow perch. Don't have to tell you guys, a, a lot of this uh, would be predominantly in January and February if we get some ice off, or should be if we have solid ice. So um, we had pretty good catch rates in the winter of 2020, despite that kind of wonky uh, year that we had with some ice, some open water, some ice, uh, etc. Um, we did see again, just pointing out, pretty good year classes. Um, so we've got our you know our one year uh, young of the year fish, uh, and then we've got a lot of fish stacked up in this uh, eight to 12 inch range with a few big ones. This one kind of surprised me. Our mean total length for those harvested um, uh, was 9.6 inches. I was, I was pretty impressed with that. I, would, I that, that one surprised me, um, that our average size of fish harvested uh, was about 10 inches. That's not a bad yellow perch. I wouldn't turn that down. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, so, go into the questions. I, I just got a couple more things, and then I'll let you guys uh, fire questions at me or, or throw things at me either way. When we asked people how satisfied they were with the current fishing opportunities is how we phrased that. Uh, so we've got uh, our orange here is satisfied. Our red there is uh, very satisfied. Yellow is neither, nor you're neither satisfied or dissatisfied, um, which I'm always surprised because I thought everybody always has an opinion. And then this is those individuals that are dissatisfied. So I was pretty encouraged. Um, typically how we look at this is we look at the percent total that are satisfied or very satisfied. We had 87% uh, of our anglers that were satisfied. And I can't, I can't remember what the sample size on this was, but it was, it was from, it, it seems like it was from a couple of thousand individuals. So it's not as if we just, you know, asked them the first five people that looked like they were smiling that day. Um, so it's, it's pretty representative. Whether or not you agree or not, it's, it's a pretty solid sample. The next question we asked was, you know, okay, uh, what can we do to improve your overall satisfaction? And uh, I'll go kind of to the meteor slide here in a minute, but basically it broke down to our answers were about 41% something to do with fisheries management about 44% uh, to do with park operations, some habitat talk, and, and a little bit of you know, other. And I'll, I'll show you this. These are probably pretty small for you guys uh, to see, but I'll point out some of them. So uh, this is the topic uh, here. They've got the categories, park operations, fisheries management, habitat, et cetera. And when we ask these questions, they're fairly, it, it's an open-ended question. So it's not like you choose from like five things. It's like you just tell us, and then we go through and kind of try to lump them into meaningful categories uh, that can make some sense. And again, these are numbers, not percentages, so don't let this confuse you. Um, pretty big chalk of them said nothing. You know, it's good. I always like to hear that. I don't hear it too often. You know, don't make any changes. But uh, one of the other ones that always comes up, not surprising, is more fish and higher catch rates, right? We always want bigger fish, we always want more fish. Um, we have more, yeah, exactly. Uh, surprisingly, bigger fish actually didn't come up that, that much. We had 11 people that said that. Um, but, you know, that's, we look at that, we take that to heart. We look at the half a fish per hour that we've got doesn't really tell us that anything's too wrong, but we totally understand, you know, people always want to catch more fish. I always want to catch more fish, there's no doubt. The uh, less recreators and the weightless zones are not surprising at all. Yes, that, that was a take home, and I definitely do not have the answer for that one. Um, but anytime we do a survey here lately, crowding or um, conflict between users obviously is something that always comes up right so this is something I don't have an easy answer for but this is something we are not ignoring we just don't have an elegant solution um, <laughs> yeah and I totally know you're joking but then I always come back and go well we'll just we'll just kick off the fishermen and then we'll have plenty of space you know it's it is a difficult situation, but it, it's something that comes up in all of our surveys is that we recognize that crowding negatively impacts your fishing experience. Um, so most of my experience with the, recre the recreator comments, it has to do with the specific type of boats, the, the, the fact that we have like huge ballast tanks on boats now, and now you can flip kayaks very easy with those, and I've seen people do it. My, we, we kind of asked the, the rangers this when they came and they didn't really know how to go about it, but how, how do we as a club maybe, the laws that are in place about the distance between wake boaters and, and, and fishermen were created before those, those boats ever existed and they need to be revisited. How do we as a club possibly propose something that could eventually change that regulation? Our <laughs> Let me do a little thinking on that, because I, I don't know that I have the perfect answer to that, but I'll throw out, you know, maybe some things for you guys to think about, and then you can chew on it, you can talk to your, your brain trust. 
talking to your local representatives, your state legislators, is never a bad idea. Um, they would have some pull on some of these issues, um, and so it's, it's never a bad idea to talk to your elected representative about what you would like to see. The other thing would be, as a group, um, writing a letter to, I'd say, both state parks who actually handle the boating laws, um, but also the Division of Wildlife Resources. Those are, those would probably be some of my first steps. What I don't have a great answer on is like kind of where do you take it from there? You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, we like to hear from you guys, but if you write a letter, that doesn't automatically mean that things change. And that's where it kind of gets difficult is how do you elevate that discussion? The, the law is one thing, but the difficulty in enforcing that law, I believe, is where the problem lies. Yeah. Because, I mean, half the time you go out on these water bodies, you don't see a whole lot of cops out on these water bodies to enforce that distance that's already put into place. That's I, true. I already break, like a lot of people are already breaking right. the regulations that are in place. So Right. So it's not, it's not always an issue with a new regulation, it's enforcement of the existing regulation or coming up with a no wake zone for fishing, kind of like, you know, we've got that little spot up at um, Rock Cliffs on Jordan L, that, that sort of idea. So, yeah, let me let me chew on that a little bit more. And again, I, I wouldn't suggest that I'm the answer to that. In other words, um, if you like my advice, it's good, roll with it. But I, I would call state parks talk to them, ask them that same thing, maybe ask your local representative, like how can we enact change or reduce conflict? And that's the one thing I always kind of remind everyone is, when you're having these discussions, you know, you, you might have had that one negative experience or 100 uh, with a wakeboard voter, but there are people that are following the rules, so you want to try to come up with some elegant solution that doesn't alienate those individuals or unfairly impact them. Did I dodge that question? Well, no. <laughs> it's a hard question to answer. Yeah, for sure. It is. Um, so I'll just say, the, you know, some of these are outside our jurisdiction, but these are ones that we share with state parks and say, hey, we're seeing this. Um, and often we, we would welcome help from groups to be a catalyst. You know, I'd like for you not to fill my inbox with, with nasty messages, but send us a letter. Remind us you guys are interested in these things, because um, that's the only way there is ever going to be kind of this broader discussion. So these are my conclusions. We may not necessarily be your conclusions. Might be better just call this a summary slide. Um, we saw a twofold increase in angler use from 2005 to 2021. Um, I will just point out these are angling hours. These are not uh, recreational users. So this is just anglers. So. We know just from anglers, we've seen a two-fold increase in, uh, in traffic out there, let alone when we were to, if we were to look at uh, recreational users. Um, one thing that was really encouraging was our catch rates have gone up since 2005. This one kind of surprised me because I always hear about the good old days. I'm not necessarily saying these are the best of days, but these are pretty good days at Jordan L relative to our catch rates right now, especially if you're interested in rainbow trout. Um, the harvest rate uh, was uh, lower this year relative to 2005. Again, I think that kind of makes sense. We've seen a lot more people shift over to catch and release or not keeping as many fish. And also when you saw that bump up in black bass users, then obviously this impacted it. Most of the time, black bass fishermen catch and release for, for good or for bad. So a little bit of changes there. Angler satisfaction uh, was much better in 2021, so I'm, I'm hoping that these are all you know real numbers. Uh, they make sense because if we've seen an increase in our catch rates, I would expect to see an increase in satisfaction. And also, I'm very encouraged that even though we have seen this increase in use, we are still keeping up with satisfaction because we know people harvesting, crowding does impact your experience. Um, we already kind of touched on these, you know, there's some actionable items in there, especially if we can um, raise the awareness with state parks to look at crowding issues, to look at ways to reduce user conflict, um, and in some of those uh, low-hanging fruit ideas, and there was a surprising number that talked about um, better 
uh, handicap or accessible access. On the uh, edge rate versus the you know, harvest rates, could part of it be the, the amount of um, stock that has been done at edge rate for catching so many small ones, you not want to keep them because it's just more. Okay. It could be, uh, so that I'll, I'll maybe give a little feedback on that and then try to come back to that question. So our average sizes uh, on 2005 to 2021 were, were pretty similar. Um, so I, I feel like the average fish that people are catching, or excuse me, keeping, that 15 inch is, is a pretty solid number. So that's, that's a fish that's been in the reservoir for about one year, is what that amounts to. There's some reservoirs where you can't, you can't keep your average rainbow trout in the reservoir for a year, it gets caught out at that 10 to 12 inch size. Relative to stocking rates, we are stocking about the same pounds as we have the past, say, five or 10 years, or past 10 years, but we switched over to a bigger fish. So there's been quite a few studies at multiple reservoirs. Jordanelle uh, is one. Strawberry's done a ton of work on this, um, showing, not surprising, that you can increase survivorship if you move to stocking a larger fish. That's pretty rudimentary. The question is, when you're looking at the number of pounds you can put in, if you're going to only put in 100,000 pounds of fish, are you better to do that with 8-inch fish, or are you better to do that with 12-inch fish? Because obviously, your 12-inch, your 10-inch fish is going to weigh considerably more. So about four years ago, we switched over, instead of the 8-inch rainbow average size, we switched over to a 10-inch. So when you're looking at some of our stocking rates and you're like, guys, you're not stocking near as many fish as you used to, we're stocking about pounds-wise what we have consistently, but we're switching over to those larger fish. So you've got basically the same pounds, but fewer number of fish. So I apologize, that was probably a lot of hemming and hawing on, on my part, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions about Deer Creek? If you guys have observations about Deer Creek, I would love to hear them. Maybe we'll start with, with the data I present if there's any questions, and then it can kind of be a free for all on Deer Creek. And if you guys have any random things you want to ask me, I don't promise I'll have the answer, but uh, be happy to talk about anything within our region. Is there any plans to include any new species of fish in Deer Creek? Not right now. No, uh, we are still, we, I mean, we are constantly gathering information and data. But based on the angler satisfaction that we saw with that 87%, based on the catch rates, I'm not proposing anything new right now unless it's some tweak. For example, if we see that, you know, we need to tweak slightly our number of pounds of rainbows going in or switch to a different strain of rainbows. Um, for example, um, I don't know if anybody used to fish Main Creek uh, in December, January, the, you know, uh, Main Creek or the Wallsburg Arm coming in there. We used to have a lot of rainbows that would come up to spawn. And uh, through some issues with the hatchery, we kind of, the strain of fish got switched over. And we had a lot of anglers say, hey, what happened to that spawning population of rainbows? And so that's the recent change that we've done. It's only been about two years. We're split up our strain, so um, we should have about 50% of the fish that should want to come up into that Wallsburg arm and kind of stage for the spawn that is often in January. It's pretty early. So, sorry, that's kind of what I meant by like a little tweak that we've done with some angler impact. So, is that, are those triplets? No, so that's a good question. So, we actually still stock fertile rainbows into Deer Creek. Um, we do get a little bit of natural recruitment. I don't know that we've ever looked at exactly how much. I, I would venture to say it's fairly small natural recruitment, but um, it does give us the opportunity to utilize uh, batches of fish. So we, whenever we do triploid fish, we've got some waters that they have to have 95% triploidy, like um, strawberry reservoir or something like that, where we really want to make sure we don't have interbreeding, intergression with um, uh, our native cutthroat or bear lake cutthroat. Um, and that's a great tool in, in lots of reservoirs. 
we don't really have that conflict at Deer Creek. We do have, you know, we've got some cutthroat and some of those little trips, but really we're not managing for cutthroat right there, so we're able to use those fertile fish. And what that does is when there's a batch of fish that comes up that has low triploidy, like it was intended for strawberry, but it's like, hey, we only got 50% sterility, that gives us the opportunity to also kind of use those fish. So we occasionally drop some triploids in there, um, but that's really just if we've got the opportunity. So. Any other questions on Deer Creek or Just comment <clears throat> that uh, our catch rate for walleye has increased dramatically in the last five years in Deer Creek. Your catch rate for your club? Yeah, the members of the club has improved greatly in that, the last five years. Is that data in a format that you could share with us? Because that'd be interesting to see. <laughs> no, it's just word of mouth. Just word of mouth. I mean, that's that's great too, but I was I was curious if you guys, you know, when you did your tournaments. Yeah, you've been killing them. Well, we finally got Skip to stop using Swedish fish for his bait, so. <laughs> I think some of it's kill though, too. I mean, yeah. as you work as a club, you have a tendency to know what's working and share it. Yeah. Versus someone that doesn't know how to catch wall and they try to catch it, but they can't. Absolutely. But, I mean, that's great information because that kind of feeds into this question about, you know, are the anglers that really fish it and kind of, you know, uh, have it figured out what have their catch rates been relative to the average angler. I never catch walleye unless I'm not fishing for them. That's, that's is there something we could do as a club to help gather information as we as we fish that or is, is that something that you would be interested in working with us with so that we can provide that data as size or yeah so uh, do, remind me do you guys do you guys fish uh, recreationally or do you still have some tournaments like we don't do tur we're not doing tournaments right now okay. we have in the past um, we do socials, so so we may go out. But if if we did it for the purpose of helping you gather data, I'm sure we could probably get more involvement on those specific days, or or even just over time. We all fish different times and different days. But if we collectively can gather that data and organize it for you, and that's helpful, that's something we might be able to help you with. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's put a little thought into. I might have some ideas for useful data, but I bet you guys have some ideas for useful data. Like, in other words, you know, this missing component if we're missing some of the significant hours of walleye fishermen at night, that, you know, things like that. Um, but I would be interested in any information that you guys have. So my uh, my cell phone number is up there. Um, I'm pretty happy to talk. I'm also pretty happy to tell you if I disagree with something you say. That's what, you know, I'm just kind of like a straight shooter that way, but. I'd be happy to talk as much as you guys want, especially on Deer Creek where I don't get to fish it as much as I would like and every little bit of information that you guys provide would be useful. And then even if it's a question that, you know, maybe I don't quite agree with the, the premise or the suggestion, if I hear that enough times, that's going to be something that I'm going to start digging to find more information on, whether that's getting it from you guys to start with or putting it as a Creole question or asking it on one of our uh, emailed out angler surveys. So I'm pretty open to, to ideas. The other thing is our new guy, Tyler Robinson, he's got a background with, uh, with walleye and with, uh, um, uh, well, drawn a blank, yellow perch, um, grew up in Minnesota. Also, he's a black bass uh, tournament angler, so I think he would be a great guy. If you guys have some ideas to plant in his head, get him while he's still young and naive. So we'd be happy to have him come back, or just we can get out and go fishing sometime. If he's from Minnesota, he's using live minnows. <laughs> that's probably going to change right there. That's the problem. We'll catch more if he does. Yeah, we, we, we got him his first cutthroat the other day, so we're, uh, we're corrupting him. I, that being said, I'm, I'm a warm water guy. I grew up in Tennessee on Kentucky Lake, um, mostly fishing for largemouth bass and like blue cats. So I'm, I'm not necessarily a cold water guy either, but. Uh, He's, he should bring a different perspective, I guess is where I was going with that. And that's one reason we hired him. It's like, we've got guys that are experts on trout and cold water, but we need a little extra expertise on the, the warm water side of things, so. I got one question for you. I'm gonna jump lakes on you. I'm trying to decide which side of the fence I'm on for the dredging of Utah Lake. Any opinion that even our club could get involved in? 
That one is a difficult question for me. Um, I would just suggest you guys, you know, on both sides, do your research. And if somebody's making a, a you know, a, a broad claim to to look and see, you know, examples from other waters, um, and to really think through the process. So I'm. Aren't the groups that are making those claims the ones that are wanting to develop that that area? I mean, aren't those coming from? Yeah, the there's some advertising, but on the other side, they, you know, there's some scientists that are saying it might help. Them. So they've got they've got scientists on both sides of the fence. Okay. And I'm stuck in the middle trying to figure out what's who's telling them the truth. Well, they don't mess with the white bass. They don't mess with the white bass. You're on the, if you're on the fence, usually fall. You want to fall in the one where there's not a lot of money to be made. <laughs> I was That's gonna say one thing about that. that so were you here when the head biologist spoke to us? Yeah. Uh, um, I started working into it more after we talked. And one thing that would pretty much be inevitable is probably be a complete overture. Yeah, first they would kill the whole thing because as you start to dredge that bottom out, you're no longer getting nearly as much turnover of the sediment, and it, it would be happen so fast that when that sediment fell out, the water would heat up to a point that it would pretty much wipe out the whole lake almost within a few and days. And the car. Yeah, and well, maybe. <laughs> maybe the the <laughs> the lake, but it would totally kill the lake, so be careful what you ask for. Yeah. And we may never see a walleye fishery. That's, I think, best walleye fishers in the whole state. Yeah. So you got to be careful what you ask for there. Everybody pictures this pretty blue Utah lake. Well, the sediment's going to fill it up again. So Yeah, I, I'd be happy to toss some ideas around uh, later with you guys on that. Um, the, the only thing I'll say about it, you, you guys no doubt probably know what, you know, we're, as a state, we're trying to let the process play out, provide comments or where we can um, to try to help either way, in other words, either way it goes, we're trying to provide some expertise. Uh, the only bit of information I might kind of throw out that I, I see sometimes when we're talking to people, they think that historically Utah Lake was this deep, super clear, cold uh, water. Um, and it's not, that, that doesn't mean there's not some things that could be done, but sometimes I talk to people that think it should look exactly like Jordan L or Deer Creek. And Utah Lake is a, is a completely different beast. Historically, it's, it was shallow. It was a little more clear than it is now, uh, mainly because it had that vegetation coming up. So this is pre-carp, right? We had all that aquatic vegetation that was coming up. Those are just like curtains, basically, that keep the waves from stirring up the sediment. Um, and then they also have all the roots of that vegetation. So um, I think you guys are right on it. Um, I'd encourage everybody to really look at it from both sides, but not to uh, not to make assumptions about what you think it should look like just based on, say, Jordan L or Deer Creek, because it's it's not a Jordan L or Deer Creek. Can't get a better pike fishery. Yeah, pike yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, on Utah Lake. That's a t that's a totally different day. We'll have to come back on that one, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'd be happy to. So, thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for letting me take up some time and, and you guys jot down my, my cell phone or my email. You're always welcome just to kind of shoot me a shoot me a text or whatnot. I'm email, if you send me an email, I'll just throw this out there. Um, I'm still in the field quite a bit, so if you send it and I don't reply, feel free to like send it again or just shoot me a text and say, hey, give me a call sometime. Um, I never you're never gonna offend me if you remind me. Um, because occasionally an email gets lost with the 112 others that I got that hour. Um, so you guys always just feel free to, to reach out with me. I think I think Skip saw that because like he sent something to Slater, and then he had radio silence from us, and then I responded back, and then like a, two weeks later I finally said, yeah, what time is it? And then I had to ask him again what time it is, so don't take it. Yeah, maybe we'll schedule next year before you leave tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everyone. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, grateful for the DNR support with our speakers, and um, we're also grateful for the support with Shills. And so I'm going to turn the time over to Jace and teach us about some of the equipment and lures and things we can be using. So, so I always like to ask, so I spend my time wisely, like, who's here to fish for trout? Who's here to fish for walleye? 
And I heard walleye talked about heavily. Walleye, a little bit of everything. Trout, a few trout guys. Uh, bass, anybody fish the bass there heavily? A few of you? Well, I don't know. I think that's what I like about Deer Creek so much is I, it's good and bad because when I go, I have way too many rods with me because I might end up doing anything on that given day. I bounce around and try to figure out what's biting that particular day. Um, recently, I started fishing for the crappie a lot. I don't know if you talked about the crappie or not. I apologize if I didn't hear earlier, but uh, it's starting to be a pretty healthy population of black crappie, and they're a lot bigger than I'm used to anywhere else in the state. So I really have kind of gotten after the crappie in recent years, but um, I fish walleye a fair amount there. I always try to go usually, usually early spring or fall before the recreational boaters get too bad, but um, the bite now is great if you're willing to fish late, like late nights, you know, out there with your flashlight. And I usually fish any rocky structure on the edges where those fish are gonna come up and feed at night. And I'm a jigger. I, I know guys are trolling planer boards and things and getting out near the shoreline, but personally, I like to jig. Um, as far as what I jig for walleye, Gold Minnow is one of my number one favorites. The only downside to them is they're not very durable, so have probably, if you think you're gonna go through one bag, make sure you have two. Um, and colors vary a lot, but there's a, this shiner color I have, could look like a variety of different minnows in there, and then good old chartreuse. I think chartreuse is hard to beat for walleye, no matter any body of water. As far as weight of heads, I've got anything from about one sixteenth ounce all the way up to half ounce in my box, and it kind of depends on where I find them that day. If I'm jigging a long vertical point that's out in 40 feet of water, I'm gonna have a half, half ounce or tight on. But if I'm in there tight to the structure and I'm in eight to 12 feet of water like I am a lot of times, eight ounce is pretty safe bet. I fish 16th real early in the year when they get real shallow. Uh, most of the time 16th though is pretty light. Um, that's just one thing I jig a lot is gold minnows, but I also have a bucktail. I think it's kind of a forgotten art fishing hair. So marabou jigs, bucktails, and sometimes I'll tip them with a piece of gold or a uh, nightcrawler, you know, a one inch piece of nightcrawler hanging off of there or even a half of a nightcrawler depending on the day. And I fish a lot of marabou and bucktails. My general rule is if I'm fishing a plastic with say a eighth ounce or a quarter ounce, I'll usually go about half that weight on my bucktail to really kind of slow it down. Just depends. Some, I'm always watching for that fall rate. I want my fall rate to be about the same on a bucktail or a hair jig as my regular jig with a plastic. So just something to look at. Um, let's talk about, let's talk about trout for a second. Um, I'm not much of a bait guy, although power baits extremely effective there off the bank early in the year, as well as, uh, you know, worms, marshmallows, that sort of thing. But I like to fish uh, suspending jerk baits and marabou jigs and tube jigs. Those are kind of my, my go-tos always. And I, I, same thing, I'll vary my head depending on what I'm seeing on the graph that day. If the fish are in 30, 40 feet of water, I'm probably gonna be fishing anywhere from like a quarter to a half ounce. Um, if they're staying stationary and I know they're trout and they're just kind of milling around, I like to vertical jig them. Instead of casting to them, I'll try to get over them. But that requires you knowing what to look for on your electronics and having a way to stay above them. So if it's windy and you don't have an autopilot feature on your trolling motor, you're kind of going to be in trouble. But if it's calm or if you've got drift socks, things like that, and you can stay over the top of them, I find it's a really good way to catch fish on your creek. So, do you have a question? Oh no, okay. Um, uh, jerk baits, I grabbed just a couple of these dynamic HD trouts. There's a million good ones out there. The biggest thing is though, is make sure that they're a true suspending jerk bait. So when, when they pause, they should stay there just like a fish does when it stops in the water. If they're not tuned right and their nose down or tail down or something, um, you either need to change hook sizes or you need to find a new jerk bait. There's some that are real cheap imported that just don't track true. Um, Pat, our, our actual fishing manager here, he has a great deal on Lucky Craft a lot of times. Um, you know, normally they're anywhere from 15 to 25 bucks a piece, and we get them for seven, eight bucks a lot of times here. They're factory seconds. Does a fish know? No, they're really a good deal, so just keep your eyes built for those. Um, let's talk about bass for a minute. That's kind of the ways I like to fish for trout. I didn't talk about trolling. Trolling's a whole other ball of wax, but 
uh, equally as effective. It just sometimes it requires a lot more gear. You know, you got to have a boat for one. Downriggers, when it starts to get this time of the year, makes it really nice when the water starts heating up and those fish get deeper than about 20 feet. There's, you know, there's uh, dipsy divers and things like that that can kind of supplement having a downrigger, but downriggers become kind of key when it's these middle of the summer hot months. So, um, but yeah, if you guys have questions on trolling, come find me, come find Pat, one of our fishing guys, and they will, they'll point you in the right direction. Um, as far as uh, Basco, um, there's a million different rigs. That's what's hard about bass is people are like, well, we're like, here's a plastic, but there's 10 ways to rig it. What do I do? Well, I fish a drop shot probably 50% of the time. And then the other 50%, I'm either fishing a Ned rig or I'm fishing a Texas rig or a, just a tube with a jig head up inside of it, not Texas rig, just up inside of it. Um, if it's a finesse bite, I also throw a fair amount of top waters on Deer Creek. So early morning, late evening, I'm throwing whopper ploppers or buzz baits or poppers, uh, spook style baits, you know, walking style baits. And a lot of times my biggest fish of the year all come off of a top water bite. I don't know why, I would love to know why, but that's just how it is. Those bigger fish seem to key in on those predatory type, you know, jerk reactions. So um, catch, every once in a while we catch one over four pounds and they're doing that, doing usually top water in these summer months. Um, as far as rigging a drop shot, has everybody drop shot or heard about it, know what it is? I think most of you are nodding yes. Well, those that don't know, you've got a small light wire hook, usually with a large gap short shank that sits above your weight, okay? And it's a really cool way to fish because you can keep your weight on bottom and your bait can do a lot of movement on top without even actually moving it. So fish that are sitting there staring at it, you don't have to pull it out of the strike zone. You can sit and entice them while it's right there in front of them. Uh, it's, extremely effective way to catch finicky fish and uh, there's times where there's finicky fish but more than anything when I take people with me that haven't bass fished a lot I just want them to catch a bunch of fish it's a super easy way to teach them just tell them like don't move the weight sit and move your rod tip give it a little slack once in a while and watch your line if it starts moving there's only one reason it's moving you know reel up and set the hook so it's a really good way to get kids or uh, new anglers involved in fishing, so learn how to tie a drop shot if you haven't. You'll have a lot of fun doing it. I brought just an example of a drop shot bait. This is just a little trick shot shad, just a little minnow imitation. You know, those smallmouth, when you're catching them, a lot of times they're coughing up little sunfish or little perch or even their their own, right? They're, they're eating each other. So something that's, you know, in that three inch, four inch size range is about as big as I fish, unless I'm like, in a tournament or something and I'm fishing for big fish, then I'll maybe go to a four or five inch bait. Um, the Ned Rig, Deadly Nedley, I'm sure everybody's kind of heard of the Ned Rig nowadays, catches anything that swims, but I did bring some Z-Man, the TRD. It's literally the dumbest bait you could fish. It just looks literally, they call them a turd. That's literally what it looks <laughs> like. And you put a jig head in it and um, you can fish it however you want. You can swim it, you can just lift your rod tip and let it do its thing and some days they eat it better one way or the other but that bait it, the key to it is how it falls so a lot of times people try too hard you just kind of need to let it fall um, one key thing to about anything i talked about with jigging i brought up here is the line that i choose for jigging and there's a lot of reasons for that but the biggest reason is if i'm using line that's clear it's a lot harder to see it and a lot of my bites come on either a fall or usually it's always a fall and when that happens it's super hard to fill that bite because you're usually giving them slack line or semi slack line so when you have braid i'm fishing this is fire line there's a million good ones i like fire line i fish nano fill a lot but i like something that's like a brighter color this one's white so white shows up good on water or uh like a chartreuse color but so that way i can see these bites that happen that may be hard then i'm always tipping them with you know especially deer creek super clear water um, fluorocarbon leader and I let you'll see people with these fluorocarbon leaders like this now I'm doing like you know 18 feet and then I'm tying like a uh, oh shoot uh, Alberto knot is one of my favorites or you can do a double uni knot but Alberto knot or a uh, oh shoot I'm gonna forget the other one Alberto knot's a good one though it's one of the easiest to tie and it doesn't take 10 hours to tie in the bottom of your boat when they're biting and you break off you know so I just look up the Alberto knot. It's pretty easy to fit to tie, but it's real small, runs through your guides good. So 
yeah, 18 feet a liter, of course that knot's gonna be in around your spool when you're making a cast, so it's important it runs through there good. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything I'm missing here. Any questions? Like, I know that was a lot in a nutshell there. I'm trying to give you guys time. If you want to go shop or whatever, you're welcome to. But come find us, guys. I'm, it's funny. I'm actually not one of the fishing guys. I'm a hunting manager, but I, I love this stuff. I've been doing it. Since I moved out here in 2010, I fish Deer Creek three or four times a week, literally. I've got a little boat. You've probably seen me. It's got a crazy camel paint job on it. It's fish shadows and ducks all on the sides of it. It's a redneck rig for sure, but I love it. And uh, yeah, if you ever see me, stop me, tell me, hey, I know you, and we'll take, maybe we'll go fish together or something. So I don't have any secret spots. I fish, if I'm dragging bottom for walleye, I fish a lot of Charleston side. If I'm bass fishing, oh boy, it just depends. I run all over the place if I'm bass fishing and just kind of look for the groups of fish. Um, my bigger fish usually come deeper. I don't fish the bank like a lot of guys do when they're fishing for size. I'm usually targeting fish in that 20 foot range, 20 to 30 foot of water instead of 10 foot. You know, it just seems like the bigger fish are always deeper. My big fish usually come on swim baits, Kitex with quarter ounce to half ounce heads. And I've got a slow gear ratio, five, three to one bait caster with like 10 pound test four carbon. I'm casting it out, letting it go to bottom. And I'm just reeling it real slow. And you'd be surprised how many big wallets you catch doing that too. So, but yeah, hope that helps a little bit. Uh, I, get, I, I love that lake. I fish Utah Lake a lot too. Just there's so many cool things you can do on both those lakes. There's very few lakes in this state that have that much variety within one body of water. And it's fun. You can go, if you want to go fish for perch this time of the year in 40 foot of water and jig and vertical, knock your socks off. Like if you want to go and fish for, you know, top water bite for bass, you can go you know, jig for walleye, or it's just, it's a cool place. And it's in our backyard, and yes, it gets used heavily, but we've always found a way to get away from the people and at least go catch the fish in my family and friends. So, but, okay, hope that helps. I grabbed one rod. I was just gonna say, if I had to pick like one king do all rod, I'd pick a good high carbon concentration or high graphite content, medium or medium light spinning rod catch just about everything that swims there with the exception of really light rigs for crappie or uh, perch. But other than that, I mean, that's just a good all-around rod. What's that? This, is, this happens to be a St. Croix Bass X, which it's a bass rod, everybody looks at that, but a lot of the stuff that's you know made for bass fishing, they're super sensitive because they're designed for tournament anglers fishing for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Naturally, they fish good in just about every you know dynamic of fishing because of that. So. But uh, yeah, hope that helps. Does anybody have any more detailed questions? Or what about the length? Length? Uh, good question. Um, I'd say anywhere from, I like a little bit longer, so I fish around a seven foot, seven foot three rod, but like a six and a half foot rod is really common length and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I just think if any anything you're fishing for a bite, you want fast or extra fast. If you're fishing like a, when I say a bite, you're feeling for a bite. If you're fishing a bait or something like that, you know, those moderate rods that or movie, they're fine for that too. They they really, the reason that, that moderate tapers there is when you go to set the fish, it doesn't react too fast and just rip the bait out. It kind of has a delayed reaction and kind of a suspension effect to a rod like that. Same with your trolling rods. You'll notice you pick up a trolling designated rod, they have a lot more wickedness to them than, any, than like a faster, an extra fast jigging type rod, if that makes sense. So, but that's kind of what I like to do. And so naturally that's the rod I grabbed, but whatever, you know, whatever technique you feel comfortable with, like let's get you set up with a rod that's for that. It's like, my wife gives me crap all the time. Like, why are you, why do you have 25 rods? And I'm like, do you play the game of golf with one club? No, okay, my point's made, you know. So like, I, I just, just, I just can't stress enough, get good equipment, come talk to the fishing guys, we'll point you in the right direction. You don't have to spend an arm and a leg. I feel like everybody's budget, we can get you the rod that's gonna be the best for your situation and what you're gonna do. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. I appreciate you using chills and coming in and supporting us as well. So, thank you. Thank you. I'll leave this stuff up here. If anybody wants to kind of look through this basket, any of the stuff I pointed out, feel free. Thanks so much, Jace. You've always got yeah. some great tips on equipment. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Trust me, I got the buggy for <laughs> Um, fishing reports, uh, anyone want to share 
I think we have to forego. If you have a Fisher okay. report, let's try the okay. Facebook thing. Okay. Because we that because they're gonna close in like 25 minutes. Okay. Uh, Rickson, can I get your help? We're gonna draw some tickets. Thank you so much. I, I just left that up there. You guys can look through it, and then uh, I'll grab it on the way out and put it up. Put it down, so. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. So we've got three eight four zero one six. One six. Four zero zero six. One six. One six. It never fails. <laughs> <laughs> but but I uh, I think this young lady probably needs this one for uh, oh. her, her great work. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, three, four, zero, one, ten. Or zero, ten. Great. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank you so much. You got your, um, just, I'll get you in touch with whoever's going to take you over. I'm even going to get myself. So. Zero, zero, five. Zero, zero, five. Okay, thanks everybody. If you if you want to, we, so we talked about possibly fishing on the twentieth at at, at uh, starvation, but it's not in stone. But look for an email. Where I got to talk to Dave, but I think there there's a lot of people who are already up there. I think that's where Dave is actually maybe going to be. But it, it's kind of a loose thing. If you want to hook up with somebody and go up on at starvation, really good night fishing there. So, what time are you guys going? I. I don't know if I can yet. That's why I'm still not sure, but we'll send out an email if, if I know there's going to be a group of people there. Thanks, everybody. Is everyone getting the emails? You're on the list? Okay.